This program is transcribed. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, nearly four million members are banded together to build better futures for themselves and their families. Their reasons for becoming Equitable Society policyholders are many, but certainly among the most unselfish and far-sighted Equitable Society members are those parents who have seen the wisdom of an Equitable Education Fund. Fathers and mothers, in just 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will tell you how to make sure that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have through an Equitable Education Fund. Tonight's FBI file, The Remorseful Runaway. According to a recent study, the population of the world is increasing by approximately 20 million every year. And of that increase, the population of the United States grows larger by about a million people annually. That extra million human beings in this nation presents a challenge to every citizen, a challenge which must be accepted in equal parts by everyone. What is to happen to them? Will we allow the crime rate to continue to increase even more quickly than the birth rate? Are we to leave to these coming generations a heritage of lawlessness from which no moral structure can be built? If that is not our wish, if we desire to leave them a United States strong in its moral fiber, then the time to act in curbing the crime wave is now. And the problem to attack first in that fight is the problem that more and more becomes the number one worry of every law enforcement agency, the problem which must be solved if any progress is to be made in hurling back the legions of crime the problem of juvenile delinquency. Tonight's file opens in a Midwestern state. A freight train rambles along through the early morning mist. A young boy, having made his way across the tops of several cars, is letting himself down into an empty coal carrier. Go ahead and jump, Stevie. There, the boy. There. I thought you missed the train. Yeah, almost did. Stuck on those railroad cops. Well, there'll be days like this, TV. Hey, how did they know we were there? Chance, my boy, poor chance. We were unlucky this time. Maybe next time we... Hey. What's the matter? We got company. Oh, you mean the boy over there? Uh-huh. What's he doing here? I don't know. He was sleeping there when I climbed aboard our little gondola. Hey, looks like he might be sick or something. I think I'll take a look at him. Hey, don't, don't bother, Stevie. Uh -huh. I've already investigated the situation. He had a cheap watch and a $20 bill on him. Oh, well, where's my cut? Uh, you don't get to cut in on this, Stevie. This is a freelance job. Hey, that ain't fair, Duke. I didn't say it was. I told you many times before, Stevie. Life isn't fair. Why should I be? Hey, I guess we're going to stop here. Yeah, it looks that way. Yeah, it looks like our company is awake, too. Yeah. Well, good morning, son. Huh? Who are you? Guests of the railroad. Where are we? Yeah, we're coming into a pleasant little community called Millville. It's one of the finest hobo jungles in the country. Hey, shall we hop off here, Duke? I'm hungry. Sure, sure. I've not eaten since last night. Hey, sort of... my watch is gone. What's that, sir? And my money is gone, too. Well, now, that's too bad, boy. They were in this pocket just before I fell asleep. Oh, now, just a minute, son. I hope you're not accusing me or Stevie here of anything like that. Yes, I am. I want my watch back and my $20. Oh, now, boy. Money, you took them and I want them back. Shut up. The railroad dicks will be all over us. Hey, that's right, boy. You better be quiet. I won't be quiet. You stole my money. Quiet, lad. Who's in this car? Don't say anything. If you don't come out, I'm coming in. Hey, he's climbing up the ladder. Oh, come here, you. Let go of me. <laughs> Nicely done, Stevie. Come on, we better get out of here. Mm. Yeah. Good 
good stew, eh? Excuse me. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's real good. Yeah, made it from an old recipe. Given to me by a very famous French vagabond. Hey, uh, we staying here long, Duke? Nope. I thought we'd catch the freight that goes by here tonight. Goes all the way to California, son. <laughs> ah, California. <laughs> See me? Did I ever tell you about the time I was prospecting for gold hey, in hey. California? Hmm? Look who's coming. Oh, the boy from the train. Yeah. Yeah, probably still wants that watch back. Gonna give it back to him? <laughs> you know me better than that, Stevie. There's no profit in returning things once... <laughs> What's the matter? The watch. I haven't got it. Well, don't look at me that way. I didn't climb it. You sure? Sure. It must have dropped out of my pocket when we jumped off that cool car. Hey, I... I've been looking all over for you. And you found it, son. Good for you. Shows perseverance. I like to see that in a young fella. Mister, I want my watch and my money. Well, I haven't got your watch, boy. Well, what would he want a watch for? He, he tells time by the sun. That's right, boy. I've always lived an outdoor life. Watches are for city folk. Well, somebody took it and my money, too. i got to have money. I've got a long way to go. If you use your wits, son, you can travel around the world without a dime. But I've got to go all the way to Reno. Why? Because, well, because my mother is there. She's getting a divorce and I want her to come home. Look, can you give me enough money to get to Quincy? I can get some money there and I'll pay you back. Uh, how can you get money in Quincy? Well, my uncle has a business there. He'll give me money. Is that true, son? Oh, sure. He's an automobile dealer. You mean he owns the business? Yeah. Son, we'll give you a hand. Honest? Yes, sirree. We'll not only see that you get to Quincy, we'll take you there ourselves. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just approaching the desk of Agent Alan Grayson. Alan, have you heard about the series of robberies down at the freight yard? Yes, Jim. I was on the night desk when a couple of those complaints came in. Oh, well, last night they put some extra railroad police on over at the yards. One of these specials found a young boy and an older man going through a boxcar. Yeah? He found them after they had broken the seal on the car, but he didn't catch them. I see. Special didn't know where they escaped to, but he got a good look at both of them, so he called in their descriptions to us. I hope they were better descriptions than we usually get. Oh, yes, they were. And we know they were good because they've just been verified. How? The railroad police at Millville called us. But they've been caught? No, they got away again. They slugged a railroad policeman there and then ran for it. Any leads on where they might have headed? No, none at all. One unusual thing is that there were three of them in this last assault. They must have found a friend. Mm -hmm. The railroad police found a watch near the car where the slugging took place. They had the initials DGC on the back, along with the numerals 47 and the crest of York Junior High School. We ought to be able to find out who that belongs to. Yes, I should think so. Well, I'm going over to the school now and check through their graduating class of 47 until I find somebody with the initials DGC. <laughs> That boy don't stay in there with his uncle too long. And what's your angle on him? Well, he's going to get railroad fare to Reno from his uncle. That should be in the neighborhood of $100. Well, how does that change the price on us? <laughs> You're greener than I thought you were, Stevie. We'll just take whatever he gets. If he comes back here. Stevie, you'll have to learn how to read character. He's a fine, honest boy. Look, just look down. He's just coming out of the showroom. Can you see He's waiting for the lights to change. Yeah, yeah, here he comes. <laughs> I never make a mistake, son, never. Now, I'm afraid I got bad news. Oh, what's wrong, son? My uncle is out of town. He won't be back until late tonight. You never make a mistake? What? Uh, nothing, nothing. Uh, how about your aunt, boy? Won't she give you any money? She's with my uncle. You mean everybody's going from the house? Uh-huh. Uh, can you, can you get into the house, boy? No, I don't know where they keep the key. Well, uh, maybe we could get in without using the key. Oh, no, my uncle wouldn't like that. Well, he wouldn't like to find you in jail when he gets back either. What do you mean? We saw a newspaper while you were in your uncle's showroom, boy. That railroad cop, he's dying. Honest? Uh-huh. And you're as guilty as we are. But I didn't do anything. Now, you don't think you'll be able to convince the police of that, do you, Sonny? You mean they're looking for all three of us? Yes. You've got to get us in that house so as we can hide out until your uncle comes home and gives us enough money to make a getaway. Well... You want us all to go to jail? No. Come on. Hello? 
Ellen, I found out who that watch belongs to. That was a quick job, Jim. Well, there was only one graduate with the initials DGC, a youngster named Daniel G. Craig. Did they have anything else on him? Well, I had his address, so I checked her after I left the school. I see. Danny sounds like a nice kid who's in a tough spot. He was running away from some relatives who were caring for him while his mother was in Reno getting a divorce. Oh, another one of those. Uh-huh. I'm afraid divorce and juvenile delinquency go hand in hand. No question about it. The way I figured, Alan, he might have been running away to Reno to be with his mother and just fell in with the other two. That's possible. Oh, while you were out, the chief of police at Quincy called. Oh, what do you want? He'd uh, gotten some word on the trail from the Millville police who interviewed some of the men in a hobo jungle. Uh-huh. They reported that the older man and the two boys had been there and cooked themselves a meal. Yeah. They were heard talking about going to Quincy, which is why Millville called the chief up there. I see. Well, let's call and give them the information we've got about young Craig. Huh? Right. Oh, and Alan, I think we'd better go over to Quincy ourselves. You make the call, I'll tell the boss we're leaving. <laughs> Stevie, this suitcase ought to be big enough. Oh, sure. We can get plenty of stuff in there. Give me that clock on the table. Yeah. Here you are. Might as well take the living cup, too. Hey, we can't get much on that. It's not costing us anything, my boy. Hey, how about this gold cigarette lighter? Oh, I didn't see it. Sure, it's okay. Well, we better not take too much. That kid will be mad when he comes down. Well, it'll take him quite a while to finish talking to his mother. Can't get Reno on the phone in a minute, you know. I think maybe we better duck before he comes back. Sure, sure. Let's not miss anything. Ah, here's where they keep the silver. Give me a hand, son. Ah, okay. That's it. There we are. Yeah. All right, as much as you can. Yeah. Hey, what are you doing? What? <coughs> we, uh, just, uh, looking around, son. What's in that bag? Oh, uh, some knickknacks. That's my uncle's stuff. You put those things back. But, my boy, uh, you, you, uh, you're going to need a little extra money for, for magazines and sandwiches on the train. You, you can't travel like a peasant. You were stealing that stuff. Stealing? What? All we're doing is borrowing some of these things to send you to Reno. I don't want to go to Reno that way. Oh, now you're not being fair to yourself, son. We don't want anything for ourselves. You're nothing but crooks. I'm going to call the police. Well, no, you don't want to do that, my boy. You'll just be making trouble for yourself. I don't care. Let them arrest me. I'm not going to let you get... Oh! You're getting very proficient at that, Stevie. Come on, let's finish packing the knickknacks. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. On many a peaceful college campus, just one month from now, thousands of eager college freshmen will hear a bell like this, calling them to their first college class. Yes, next month, half a million young men and women, sons and daughters of farmers, doctors, laborers, and businessmen, will be starting their first year in college. What about your boy, Frank? Are you planning to send him to college when the time comes? I hope so, Mr. Keating. I'd like my kid to have the chance I never had myself. Mm, That's a good way to look at it, Frank. And if I were you, I'd make certain of having the money to send him to college. Start right now by setting up an equitable education fund. What's that? A plan for saving money? It's more than that, Frank. It's a complete plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. And once you start, your children are certain to get the funds necessary for their education, regardless of what happens to you. Now, here's how the plan works. First, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Second, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Third, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. Well, that sounds like a real practical idea. Why don't I see someone from the Equitable Society right away? That's it, Frank. Get in touch with an Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's the way to be sure, with an Equitable Education Fund, that your boy or girl will answer the call of the college bell. (laughs) 
Now back to tonight's file, The Remorseful Runaway. There are few people in the country who are not anxious to see the problem of juvenile delinquency conquered, but for the most part, they feel themselves helpless. They ask in plaintive tones, what can I do? What can any one person do in such a big fight? The answer is that no one person can solve juvenile delinquency, just as no one soldier can win a war. But if every soldier adopted the attitude that there was little he could do to help gain victory, there would be no victory. Wherever you are, and whoever you are, you can help fight the battle to prevent our youngsters from becoming criminals. You can help fight it in many ways. One of those ways, and this applies to you whether you are a parent, a teacher, or just a person who occasionally comes in contact with a child, is to teach the child to respect law and order. See that under no circumstances is any criminal ever invested with properties of glamour or bravery. See that any child you discuss the subject with fully understands that the noble qualities are on the side of the law, that the important qualities are those in the motto of your FBI, fidelity, bravery, integrity. Tonight's file continues in a room at police headquarters in Quincy. Alan, I just talked to the chief of police. Nothing's come in on the alarm yet. It doesn't seem possible that all three of them could have come to Quincy and left again without being spotted. No, but if they're here, they're being very quiet. Has young Craig's mother been notified about any of this? Yes. She'll notify us through the office in Reno if she hears from Danny. But I'm afraid we can't wait for that. No. If he's hitching his way, it might take him a couple of... Oh, excuse me. Mm. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Hello, Taylor. This is Chief Ward. Oh, yes, I'm hello, down the Chief. Hall of my office. You got word on the Craig boy. Huh? You've located him? Yes. His uncle, a man named Russell, got home this afternoon from a business trip and found young Craig unconscious in the living room floor. I see. Have you spoken to the boy? Yes, just finished. He mm. said that the old man, the other young boy he was with on the train, came to his uncle's house with him. Mm-hmm. Said that he went upstairs to call his mother in Reno, but couldn't get through to her, and that when he came down, he found them robbing the house. Is that when they knocked him out? Yeah, threatened to call the police, and the other young boy hit him on the head from behind. Chief, could he tell you who the other two were? That the older man's name is Duke, and the young boy's first name is Stevie. Duke and Stevie. Well, I'm afraid that isn't going to be much help. Well, I've got a list of things that were stolen if you want it. Yes, that's fine, Chief. Thanks. I'll come down to your office for the list. Hope it don't rain. Why, why? What difference does the weather make? Rain brings the flowers, Stevie. And where'd you say that guy was? The fence? Uh-huh. Yes, not very far now. But you said you wasn't here in such a long time. How do you know this guy? <laughs> I was selling him stuff before you were born, Stevie. He was buying some of my valuables far back as uh, 1920. Well, that's a long time ago. You sure it's on his block? Yep. It's right around this corner. This bag's getting heavy. It's good for your muscles. Yeah, I know. You said that before. Well, I'll be. Well, what's the matter? You see that empty lot across the street? Uh-huh. That's where the fence store used to be. Oh, no. Now, what do we do now? Son, I guess I've been a failure with you. You haven't learned the most important thing I've tried to teach you. Mm-hmm. Now what? I've tried to tell you that the successful thief is the one who doesn't get discouraged. You've got to be able to improvise as you go along. The fence is gone. We've got to accept that. Now there's only one thing to do. Go to some other pawn shop. Come on, man. Come on. Danny, this is Special Agent Taylor. Jim, this is Danny Craig. Hello, Danny. Hello, Mr. Taylor. Sit down, son. Make yourself comfortable. Thank you, sir. The alarm has gone out on that list of things that were stolen from Danny's uncle's house. Oh, that's fine, Alan. I think I'll go out by the desk just in case somebody calls in with a report. Okay, Alan. See you later. Well, Danny, I'd like to ask you a few questions. All right, Mr. Taylor. What made you run away in the first place? I wanted to be with my mother. 
I didn't want to live with my aunt. Have you spoken to your mother? Yes, I spoke to her this morning. You going out to Reno to be with her? No, sir. She's coming back home to be with me and Pop. Hey, that's fine. I'm glad to hear it. That ought to make you feel pretty important. Yes, sir. Well, now, Danny, what can you tell me about Duke and Stevie? Well, I think I told the police pretty nearly everything I remembered. Mm -hmm. Well, let's find out if I've got all the facts straight, huh? Now, the first thing that happened was... Oh, excuse me, Danny. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Uh, it's Chief Warren again, Taylor. Yes, Chief. That pair who knocked out young Craig just tried to sell their loot. They did where? A pawn shop on Main and Third Streets. The owner didn't want to buy anything from them, so no, so they left. How long ago was that, Chief? Oh, about half an hour ago, mm -hmm. just before we sent out the alarm to the pawn shop, so the list of stolen goods. Well, they might still be in the neighborhood. Chief, I think we'll use that car you lent us and do some cruising. <laughs> covered this territory pretty well, Jim. Yeah. I don't see how they could have gotten too far. That stuff must be pretty heavy. Uh, a warrant in the car 21. Yes, come in, Chief. There's a teletype here from your home office. Will you read it to me, please? Yeah. Reads, uh, nickname, file, Washington. Reveals man being searched for. Answers description, Edward Mason, known as Duke. FBI circular 17342-47. All right, thanks, Chief. I looked up the circular we had on file. Mason has been arrested 23 times over a period of 35 years. Uh, tell me, is there anything predominant in the record? Well, 11 of the arrests were for breaking into and entering sealed freight cars. I see. Hey, just a moment, Taylor. Car 9's calling in. Well, at least we know who we're looking for. Yeah, yeah it's a help. I wish we could get some kind of a lead before it gets dark. I'm afraid we're going to have to, Ellen. If they get the advantage of another night, they might be able to get out of town. Well, we've got to catch them while it's still light. Or in the car 21. Come in, Chief. That was Patrolman Page in car 9, Taylor. Mason and the young boy went to a pawn shop at Oliver and Fifth Street. Good. Have they been apprehended? Oh, the pawnbroker had already received the alarm, but when he tried to hold them, the young boy knocked him down. They got away. I see. All squad cars in the street have joined in the search. Okay. Thanks, Chief. Jim, we'd better get over there, hadn't we? I don't think so, Alan. Huh? Well, we're going to wait right here. Got a hunch they're headed this way. Yeah, let's hop into this car, son. Hey, but there's no engine on this car. Yeah, there will be. Go ahead, jump up. Hey, you want some help? No, I can make it. Yeah, just sit down until she starts. Yeah, but first, uh, give me a hand. We'll close this door. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 You shouldn't have left that suitcase, son. That was too heavy to run with. I know, I know. But a man don't get many chances like that. When he does, you ought to take advantage of him. Uh, sure, that's easy for you to talk. Uh, I was the one carrying it. <laughs> if I were ten years younger, then I carried the bag, and you too. Uh, you're always saying if. <laughs> that's because all life is a gamble, son. If you go one way, you win. If you go the other way, you lose. <laughs> yep. If is mighty big word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know where this train is headed? Certainly. It's 518 out of here, doing San Francisco on Thursday morning. Are we going all the way? Yep. Yeah. That's the engine being hooked on. Well, if I had that watch, I could tell you just how soon we'd be pulling out. No, it can't be too fast for me. <laughs> See, huh? I'm ratting out. Why shall I in here, Alan? Okay, Jim. Can't see anything. Yeah, let me have it for a minute. Yeah. You're right. Let's go down to the next car, Jim. Hey, wait. There they are. Hey, they faked. All right, you two. Come on out of there. Uh, 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 just a minute, gentlemen. Uh, are you uh, fellow officials of the railroad? No. We're special agents of the FBI. Now, come on. The 
criminal known as Edward Duke Mason received a 20-year sentence for larceny. His young accomplice was sentenced to 10 years for theft from interstate shipment. When Special Agent Taylor received word over the two-way radio from Chief Warren that the pair being searched for had fled from a pawn shop, he was driving past the freight yards. Because Duke Mason had been arrested 11 times for having broken into freight cars, Special Agent Taylor correctly assumed that he would head for the nearest railroad yard. And thus, a man who corrupted the lives of approximately a dozen children in the past whom he had taught to steal was apprehended by the closely knit actions of a local police department and two agents of your FBI. This case, like so many others in the files, could not have been closed without the invaluable aid rendered by a local law enforcement agency. Ordinarily, such smaller agencies remain unnoticed and unsung. And for that reason, your FBI wishes to salute the local police throughout the nation. Without them, law and order would be impossible to maintain. For these men, your local police, form your first line of defense against the common enemy, America's army of criminals. In a moment, we will tell you about next week's case from the files of your FBI. Now here's a man who has a point he'd like clarified. Well, it's about that equitable education fund, Mr. Keating. Suppose I should get in an accident and become disabled. Well, what happens? Do I have to drop the fund? No. That's the beauty of this plan. If you are totally or permanently disabled, you won't have to make any further payments. But the fund will go right on building up. It's one of many fine features that your equitable society representative will explain to you in detail. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A story that describes the involved workings of professional swindlers. Its subject, extortion. Its title, The Wrong Way Shakedown. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Wrong Way Shakedown on This Is Your FBI. Forest fires last year ruined enough timber to build about 86,000 homes, and we're coming into another forest fire season. So be particularly careful with cigarette ashes, matches, and campfires. This program was transcribed. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.